Uh, let's get with it. How many remember the old Heinz 57 ketchup commercial, Anticipation? It's making me wait. How many remember the, remember the, oh, am I that old? Come on now. <laughs> it's also a Carly Simon song that they took it from. I don't know if many people know that. But, but there was a, and the, the, the big thing was this is such a thick ketchup, but it's worth it. Just, and they'd have these commercials, the person just tipping it up and tipping it up and nothing coming now. But anticipation, it's making me wait. Oh, it's going to get there. How many ever waited for it? I never licked the, to the middle of the lollipop. And I know, how many took a knife? <laughs> I'm a knife person. Just stick that knife in there. Pull that sucker out. I ain't waiting. Well, folks, we have to wait. There is no speeding up the coming of Jesus Christ. Last week we looked at how Jesus died for our sins, right? Paid for it 100%. Anybody who comes to Jesus and asks for his forgiveness will be freely given. Complete forgiveness. Relationship with God, eternal life. That's God's promise. And he rose that third day, didn't he? And then he spent 40 days with his disciples, meeting with them, meeting with Peter, meeting with James, his half-brother, and also his other half-brothers as well. <laughs> Made sure all of them were taken care of. All of them got saved, like Jude and James, who became leaders in the church. He was seen at one point by 500 people. He went and saw Mary Magdalene. He went and saw these people, and he spent 40 days teaching them, but then he said what? I must go. In fact, let's take a look at that right now. Acts chapter 1. We read it during the responsive reading, but let's read in particular this part. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, because he is going to leave. Physically, he will not be with them. Spiritually, always. But physically, I will not be here. But he says to them, but you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. There will be God's power on you. The Holy Ghost will be within you, right? In fact, he says, I will be with you. My Father will be We will spiritually be with you. But you will all have the power of the Holy Ghost upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And then they ran into town and told everybody. No. What did they do? Verse 10. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Saying what? What are you looking at? <laughs> and what were they looking at? How many think they were probably looking, is he coming back? Is he coming back now? Is he coming now? How about now? Now's a good time, but no, they were going to have to what? Wait. Verse 11. And these two men also said, You men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. And he will come back and he will come to the clouds. He will take us to be with him and then he will ride into Jerusalem and he will establish his kingdom on this earth for a thousand years and then he will create a new heaven and a new earth and judge all people and those who put their trust in him whose name is written in the book of life will be with him forever and ever in a new heaven and a new Jerusalem forever and ever. In fact, what he tells disciples I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will what? Come again to receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That's John chapter 14, verses 2 and 3. That is what we're looking forward to, but what do we do in the meantime? Should we just be outside looking up at the sky? Is it coming yet? Or do we have work to do? Anticipation. How many have ever anticipated something? A wedding, a birth, a vacation? The pandemic being over. <laughs> the waiting can be the hardest part, can it? The anticipation. When is it coming? In fact, what were the last words recorded in the Bible of Jesus Christ? Revelation 22, 20 says, Surely I come quickly. I don't know how he defines quickly. <laughs> but it's been some time, hasn't it? Almost 2,000 years, we're still what? Waiting for him to come. Does that mean he's not coming? That's what the world says. Well, if he hasn't come yet, that must mean he's not coming. 
Well, that's just terrible, terrible reasoning. <laughs> just because something hasn't happened yet, does that mean it's never going to happen? In fact, we'll look at it the other way. Every promise he made, he has kept. So will he keep this promise? Absolutely. He is coming in, but the anticipation can be hard. Waiting can be hard. Anybody ever notice that time goes slower when you're waiting? That's a horrible feeling. Just wait. When they come, and when they come, and when they come, and when they come. I, eh, and you don't know when they're coming. You don't know how far it is. I mean, that's what we're, that's what we're in right now. As we talked about last week, Friday has happened. Our sins have been forgiven. Sunday's coming. Jesus Christ is coming again, isn't he? We're in this Saturday. We don't know how long it is. We don't know. So what should we be doing? Well, this is known in the Bible as the what? The church age. That's the age that we are in. Jesus Christ, when he gave them the Holy Spirit, he established his church. Remember he told them, go into Jerusalem and wait. By the way, how long did they have to wait? Ten days. Now, I always wondered, what did they do during that ten days? It appears to me they spent those ten days just hanging out in a room. Let me ask you something. What should they have been doing for those ten days? What should they have been doing? The day Jesus left, what should they have been going out and doing? Witnessing. Telling the world that Jesus Christ has come. Shouldn't they have? But instead, they were waiting, and they didn't know how long, and they were waiting and waiting, and it was finally that day of Pentecost when, Jesus, when the Holy Spirit came upon them, and Peter went out and preached, and we have all those people now coming to the church, and the church was created. That began the church age, the church age that will end with what? The rapture. What are we supposed to be doing? <laughs> What are we supposed to be doing during this time? Should we all just be sitting back and waiting for him to come? Just sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting and looking to the sky and looking for signs and waiting and waiting? Or do we have a job to do? How many think we got a job to do? We got a job to do. That's what we're going to look at this week. What should we be doing in the meantime? Well, how should we spend this time of waiting as we wait for our Lord to come? And let's take a look at this church age. Let's first of all look at the fact that it was promised let's look at god's promise jesus christ to peter and matthew chapter 16 everybody go there please matthew chapter 16 verse 15 matthew chapter 16 and we're going to look at verse 15 now jesus it says here was in caesarea philippi and he kind of wants to know from the disciple, who do people say that I am? And is that important, by the way? Who do you believe Jesus is? Isn't it okay just to know that there was a Jesus, some Jesus, a Jesus? I can decide who Jesus is, and as long as I put my faith in some kind of Jesus, I'm okay? No, it's not. Because Jesus is a person, isn't he? Jesus is God, isn't he? He is who he says he is. He is who he proved to be. And we must put our faith in who he is, not who we think he is. So they gave some answers, but here in verse 15, he turns to them. He said unto his disciples, but whom say you that I am? Not what everybody else is saying. They got all kinds of theories about who you are. But who do you say I am? And I ask you that question. Who do you say Jesus is? Well, Peter, often the one to speak up first for good, sometimes for bad. <laughs> He's always quick with his mouth. <laughs> he says, And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Got it right. <laughs> In fact, what does Jesus say to that? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. God is the source of all truth. It doesn't matter if that's what Peter thought he was or believed him to be. It happens to be also the what? Truth given to him by God. He is the Christ, the one who was promised to come and save us. He is the Son of the living God. He is God in the flesh who came to die for our sins. That's who He is, isn't He? Put your faith in Him. And then He says this in verse 18, I say unto thee that thou art Peter, which means rock, 
And upon this rock I will build my, what? Church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt thou loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And we see God uses Peter after he day of Pentecost, even on the day of Pentecost, as he makes that great sermon, opening the gates to all those people, as he goes and he starts the church and he goes to the Gentiles, he goes to the Samaritans, he goes to the other most part of the world to tell them that Jesus Christ, who he is, and opens the gates to them. So we have a promise. God said it's coming and it has come, just as he said. I want you to know something in there, though. It says the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I started thinking about that this week. Why does hell have gates? Usually you think of gates as to do what? Keep people out, right? Isn't that about what they did back then? You had gates and you had walls around the city to keep people out. Hell doesn't want to keep people out. <laughs> Hell's not a city protecting its citizens. It is a prison trying to keep its people in. So when it says the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church, that means Satan cannot stop us from getting people out. And then our, that's our job. <laughs> our job is to get people out of prison. Our job is to get them out of those bondage that they're in to sin and that judgment that is before them. That's our job. And gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of God. I also start thinking about that the other way. Once we're in the hand of God, who can pull us out? Nobody. God's better than the devil. I don't know if you knew that. But this is just another example. <laughs> God's more powerful. Satan can't pull us out of God's hands, but can we go in there and pull people out of his hell? Yes, we can. There's people out there that are in it right now. They ain't alive and breathing, but they are condemned already. They're headed for hell. What is our job? Is to get them out of there. In fact, that is one of the purposes. Purpose of the church. And again, we read one of them. Right at the beginning. Let's go to Matthew chapter 28. This was part of our responsive reading. Matthew chapter 28. Verse, we'll start in verse 18. Just to back it up one. Matthew chapter 28. We'll start in verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them. Now this is after he rose again. Once again he proved who he is. He had died for the sins. He had risen again. And he has a command for them. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore. In whose power? In God's power. In his power. We need to go in God's power and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And this is our purpose, is to evangelize, right? To go tell people the truth. Let them know. Is it our jo job to judge? No, that's the Holy Spirit's job. He's the one that convicts. He's the one that judges. He's the one that lets them know. What is our job? To teach. To preach. To tell. To witness. To tell them the truth. And then allow the Holy Spirit to work in their life to change their heart. That is our job, is to teach all the world, everybody, anybody. That is the job of the church, is to evangelize. How's it doing? Sometimes good. Sometimes not so good. Actually, I was watching a TV show yesterday. I don't know if anybody watches Last Man Standing. It's on its last leg. <laughs> it's, in fact, it's going to be canceled after this season. But I happened to be watching it yesterday. And there's one character I really like on that show. It's Kyle. I don't know if you've ever seen the show. But Kyle, very simple man. But I don't know if you've been watching lately, but he's now going to be a minister. He's studying to be a minister. And he was having his homiletics class. Homiletics just means preaching. <laughs> so he has a preaching class. He was very depressed because his teacher said, 
you need to be more interesting when you preach. You need to be able to grab people's attention. You need to be able to make them want to hear what you say. And he's kind of depressed because he's kind of a low-key guy. <laughs> he's kind of a low-key guy. And his boss, not a, not a great guy, not a great example. <laughs> but Ed, his boss, takes him aside and he says, When my father died, he gave me two things. And he pulled out a Bible from his desk. He said he gave me his Bible and he gave me a gun. I have to admit, I've used the gun more than I've used the Bible. <laughs> Hunting. So, and outdoor man's the whole thing. So he says, and the problem I had was while my dad read the Bible all the time, the way he lived his life, he never wanted me to know about anything in the Bible by the way he lived his life. I didn't want what he had. He may have known it, but he didn't live it. And I didn't want, any, want really anything more to know about it. And he said to Kyle, I don't care what your teacher says. One thing I know is the way you live your life makes me want to know what's in this book. That's in a TV show, people. <laughs> Somebody knows what they're talking about. And I thought that was so relevant to, to us as a church. What is our job? Our job is to live our life in such a way that the world out there wants to know our God. Wants to know what's in our book. <laughs> wants to know what's going on in our life that's different. Because as the Bible says, if all we're doing is going around and fighting each other and judging each other and backbiting and fighting and doing all that kind of stuff, if all we do is go out into this world and be hypocrites and do our own thing and live like they do and act like they do and talk like they do, you know what they see? Nothing they want. But if we go out in this world and we speak love, as Jesus did, if we go out and preach the truth of the gospel and the hope of the gospel and the peace that comes even during difficult times that comes from the gospel, then the world will take notice, won't it? And that's our job. Our job as a church is to evangelize. And we evangelize by doing what Jesus told them to do, witness. And the way you conduct your life and by the things you say, make them want to know who God is. And that's our job. But we have some other jobs too because that's a hard job. <laughs> In fact, let's go to Hebrews chapter 10. Let's see another purpose for the church. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Hebrews chapter 10, 23, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Let us hold on to the, the truth of God, right? Again, Satan's not going to give up. <laughs> He's going to keep coming at us. He's going to try to keep planting seeds of doubt, won't he? God, he's those, telling us those lies and deceive. He says, no, hold fast to the truth, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. The next, next thing we need to do is we need to exhort one another. And exhort just means the same as provoke, which is what? Kick each other in the pants every once in a while. We just got to do, we got to encourage each other. We got to encourage each other to love because it does not come natural. How many of us here are human? Raise your hand if you're human. You got a problem. <laughs> Love, as God loves, does not come natural. Doing good works, doing the right thing, living righteously, does not come natural. And he says, I need you as a church to help one another with this. Again, not judge. <laughs> not to sit there and run each other down, make fun of each other because we're doing it wrong, or any of that, but instead to kind of kick each other in the pants a little bit and say, hey, we can do better. A chain is only as strong as it's what? Weakest link. We need to exhort one another. Encourage each other to love. Encourage each other to do good works. To help 
each other. Do these things. That's why we're together. That's why he gives us one another. We've got to do that and exhort one another to love and good works. In fact, look what he says next in verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the man, as the habit of some is. Already, you realize how early Hebrews was written <laughs> in the church? <clears throat> already in the church, people were already saying what? I ain't got to go to church. That organized stuff, no, it's just me and God. Me and God. I got, I got the Bible. I got my God. No problem. Well, let me ask you something. If you never had to go to school, how many of those books would you have read? <laughs> how much math would you have learned? <laughs> how much history would you have learned? Church is there to give us the kick in the pants, isn't it? It's there to kind of force us to at least once a week, sometimes more, to open up the Word of God, think about it, learn from it. Yes, technically, you can be a Christian that's out on your own, never go to church, and know Jesus Christ as your Savior and be saved. But who does that leave you open to? I'm going to tell you something. The devil's stronger than you. He's more deceptive than you. And he will get you off track. That's why we need to be together, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together so we can exhort and provoke one another to love and to good works, the things that do not come naturally, to forgiveness and to all these things that we need to be doing. We need to be there, and the job of the church is to exhort one another. It's also to do this, Ephesians chapter 4. <coughs> Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. <coughs> Here, another E. Edify, to build up. Help grow, right? Look what it says, starting in verse 11 of Ephesians 4. And God gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers, and there are so many other things that God has given us. For what purpose? For the perfecting, maturing of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying, building up of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfectly mature man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. And that's the thing. It is for the church itself to be built up, but also each individually, that we built up into the image of who? God. We're not building an army here. <laughs> We're not building an army so we can go and we can take down the infidels. We're not building an army so we can go and kill people and we can exert God's power over this world. What are we building? We're building Christ. We're building the image of Christ in this world. A group of people, the church that has God's compassion, has God's passion, has God's love, has God's forgiveness, that shows the world Christ. Because Christ physically is not here, but we are. And we need to do that as a group, but also individually that we grow into the image of Christ. It's kind of like that old Goofy cartoon. Anybody, anybody any Goofy fans? I love Goofy. He was doing an exercise, and the first thing he did is they put a big uh, poster on the wall of Atlas. This, you know Goofy. He looked nothing like Atlas. But he said, you know, if you do these exercises, you'll look like who? Atlas. I did a picture. You're going to grow into this. And he, of course, Goofy tried all the different things. He was thrown all over the place and wrecked. And then finally, he got thrown way up in the air, and then he got slammed in back through the wall, and the body of Atlas was over the front of him. He says, now I'm it. <laughs> but not falsely, but truly, we are being formed in the image of who? Not Atlas, <laughs> but Christ. And to do that, we need the church. We need to be active in the church so we can get fed the good things 
that will help us mature, that we can gain in the knowledge that will help us mature, so we can get through those tough times and those rough patches in life, so we can continue to move forward instead of backwards in our walk with the Lord. We need this. That's why you get, God doesn't do anything just for the fun of it. There's a purpose to all he does. And he's the one that what? Created the church for these purposes. In fact, on that day of Pentecost, what did the church immediately start doing? If you go to Acts chapter 2, let's go to go there. Keep a finger in Ephesians because we're coming right back. So keep something there. Just help you out a little bit. But let's go to Acts chapter 2. What did they immediately start doing? Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 42. And that church that was born that day on Pentecost, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So what did the early church do? They got together. How often? All the time. For what purpose? So they can hear the doctrines and the teaching of the apostles so they can grow in their knowledge and understanding. So they could get together and encourage and exhort one another. So they could grow together and then also what? Evangelize by just their simple acts of love for one another, by their simple acts of getting together and praising God and praying. Who took notice? The world took notice and said, what's that all about? And how many were saved? Hundreds, thousands. As God saw fit, they kept coming, and they kept coming, and they kept coming. That's the job of the church still today, isn't it? All of those things. We need to do these things in the meantime. As we wait for the Lord to come, what's our job? Be the church that God promised, fulfilling the purposes that he has for us. But there's also going to be what? Persecution. The enemy ain't going to lay down. Satan ain't going to lay down. He's going to be put down. And God's going to do it in his timing. In the meantime, what? We've got to deal with it. In fact, let's go to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. If you kept a finger in four, you're not far away. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Again, Paul's writing to a church here. A church under persecution persecution by people but look what he says to them for we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities against powers against the rulers of the darkness of the world against spiritual wickedness in high places we will be persecuted it's not the world yes we'll see that but who is the main persecutor of the church who is the main person that we have to deal with and that's satan right Satan will continue to come after the church. He will try to get us off course. All those things we've been studying. He will deceive. He will destroy. He will divide. He will do all those things to try to make sure the church does not fulfill its purpose. That it doesn't go out and evangelize. That it's a terrible example of God in this world. That it does not encourage, does not get together, does not encourage one another, and does not build up the people. That's what he's trying to do is tear us down. So we do not do what God wants us to do. And he will keep at us and keep at us and keep at us. How do we combat that? Well, Ephesians says, put on the whole armor of God. What does the church need to do? Pray, right? <laughs> Seek God's help. Will God protect his church? Yes, if we put our trust in him. Not ourselves, but in him. So we will be persecuted by Satan. He will come after us, but also people will. Let's go to John chapter 16. John 
John chapter 16. Even before Jesus goes to the cross, he wants to make sure his apostles know what's ahead. And by the way, Jesus does know what's ahead. <laughs> and he says this will happen. John chapter 16, verse 1. These things have I spoken unto you that you should not be offended. You shall not fall away when they happen. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time comes that whosoever kills you will think that he does God's service. And these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things have I told you that when they shall come, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said not unto you at the beginning, because I was with you. And when Jesus left, the world will come after us, won't they? Satan will put it on their heart. In fact, some will even believe they are doing it to please God, in service to God. Anybody, that, anybody come to mind? Like Paul, <laughs> who became such a warrior for God, but at the beginning was doing it for God, quote-unquote. And they're going to come after us. What should we do? Run away? Cower? Hide? No, trust in the Lord. And when it comes, know that he promised it was going to come. Realize it's still in his plan. God's still in control. And let's keep doing what? What should we do in, in light of persecution? Keep doing those things. <laughs> keep evangelizing. Keep exhorting. Keep edifying. Keep at it. Because that's our job. Who will take care of the persecution? God will take care of it. Right? So, we have the promise, we have a purpose, we have persecution, but the Lord will see it through. You know what else we have? Let's go to a couple of verses. John chapter 16. You're already there. I'm not, because I accidentally closed my Bible. John chapter 16. What else did Jesus say to his disciples? Yes, persecution is coming. Yes, it's going to be difficult, but there is help. John chapter 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, <coughs> in spite of all that stuff that's going to happen to you, <coughs> I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. It's good that I physically go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he, the Holy Spirit, is come, he will reprove the world of sin and righteousness and of judgment. In fact, the reality is we have help. In evangelizing, do we have help? Yes. In fact, who's carrying most of the load? When it comes to us and God, who's always carrying most of the load? God's carrying the most of the load. He will help us be the witness we need to be. He will give us the words to say, and he's the one that will work in their heart. He's the one that will work in their soul. He's the one that will actually bring them to God, and he's the one that will save them, right? We have help. Who will help us in exhortation? Help in provoking one another. Again, it's the Holy Spirit that will work through us. Give us the words to say. Give us that heart of compassion for one another and help for one another. And we'll also work in the life of that other person to make them the person they need to be. Who will help us edify and build up? That's God's doing that. He's the one placing those pastors and teachers and prayers and givers and all of those people in the church, isn't he? He's the one that is sitting there making sure we have everything we need to be built into the person of Christ. He's the one reminding us of these things. God is working in all these things. We have help. Don't sit here and say, as we're down here waiting for the Lord, that we're all alone. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. And if I go away, I will send the Comforter, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, who will be in you, right? He is with us, folks, and we can accomplish these things through His power, can't we? In fact, look at 1 Corinthians, well, we need to go to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 12 just talks about how He puts different people in the church, gives us the gifts we need, right? It is God that is doing these things to help us build up. But let's also note, remember, there is a hope. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. So there is help from God, and there is hope from God. 
Because will this church age, will our work just never be done? No, it will be done. And it will be worth it all, won't it? 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, those who have died, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, how many believe that? Amen. Amen. We know Jesus died for our sins. We know also he has risen again. Even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep, will not go before them or prevent them. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Yes, life is hard. Yes, we're going to go through a lot. But nothing we go through compares with the glory that it will be of seeing Christ face to face. Of being with him forever and ever. First in in his heaven and then in his new heaven and new earth. To know we are his and we belong to him and will never sin and no more pain, no more sorrow. None of that ever again. That's what is ahead of us. The church age does end. Our work comes to an end. Sin will be no longer. No longer need because we will all be perfect. No need to encourage because we'll all be doing what we're supposed to be doing. And no need to evangelize because everybody will be saved. The It does come to an end, but in the meantime, it will be worth it, won't it? If we can just reach down and snatch one out of hell, two, three, it is worth all we go through, isn't it? That's our job, folks. Anticipation is it's coming. Let us not just sit there looking up in the sky, (laughs) waiting, looking for signs, saying, when's it coming, when's it coming? No, let's instead be about the work that God has for us. Putting aside the things of this world, let us focus on the things of God and work for Him and be the church that we're supposed to be. Whether it is the church universal, the church local, we need to make sure that we are doing the work of the Lord, that we are evangelizing, exhorting, and edifying, and that we're all part of that process so we can change this world. That's God's purpose, isn't it? And we got help? Absolutely. Absolutely. We got hope? Absolutely. So, what are you up to? (laughs) How are you spending this Saturday of life? (laughs) The Sabbath, as we wait for Sunday to come. Well, we need to be about the work, making sure that the Lord is part of all that we do. And we are His workmen in this world. Let's pray.